Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Nature Connection Show with Lisa and Nancy, publishers of Big Blend magazines and nature photographer Margot Carrera. Hey everybody, welcome to Big Blend Radio's Garden Gossip Home and Garden Show and our Nature Connection Show. I love these shows when we get to have two shows in one. Um, And that's because we've got Jennifer McGinnis back on the show. She was on our show a few years ago with her book, Micro Food Gardening. Highly recommend that book. And as soon as we saw that she's got a new book out, we thought we got to get her back on the show. Uh, Her new book is called Bird Friendly Gardening Guidance and Projects for Supporting Birds in Your Landscape. And this is really important. That's why it's on these two shows. Um, Right now, I think we have a big, severe decline in birds across North America. And one thing we can do and take action on instead of getting upset about things is get in our gardens, even our patios, right? And start planting the right things to attract these birds because they're a very important part of our ecosystem, even for us humans. So I encourage you to go to Jennifer's website, frauzinni.com, and pre-order the book. So welcome back, Jennifer. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for having me back on today. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, We're happy to have you here. And uh, we're going to, we went from micro food to birds. So how, what was that? What happened? Is it from you gardening and then having birds around you? What was it that led you into, okay, we're going from food gardening to micro food gardening to (laughs) we're going to go and garden for birdies. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, um, it is a little bit of a different shift. Um, mm-hmm. I <laughs> I would say it definitely is influenced on my property and where I have uh, the ability to garden. So growing up, I was always intrigued by birds. You know, I, um, ha- I had the feeder out with my, you know, with my family garden. Um, and that was, I didn't know at that time that you could plant specific uh, shrubs and perennials to attract those birds to your property. I thought it was just, you know, you put your feeder up at the winter time and put some seed out. Um, so I always had them like in the peripheral, right in the background. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was very much into growing the micro food because I do have limited space. Um, a lot of my full sun areas are in the driveway of my property. So that's definitely not conducive to, um, you know, large, large plantings at all. Um, but then I do have uh, a front yard that has been a little bit wild. I've incorporated uh, some edibles in there, some fruiting trees, some fruiting bushes. And I noticed that just over time, the more native plants I started putting in, the more birds and critters that would show up. And I think it also is tied to pollinator gardening. Because um, mm. when you start increasing, you know, planting the flowers to get them close to the vegetables, to bring them in for pollination, you start noticing everyone else who starts showing up also. So now I was getting more caterpillars in the garden, um, more insects, and that was bringing in the birds. So um, it was a really like aha moment for me, like, oh, I can make this happen here. Um, And then it it was a rabbit hole for sure. (laughs) I love that. And yeah, rabbits are welcome too, you know? I love bunnies. They're good for aeration of the soil, right? And and birds are, are helpers in the garden. They're good. They, they distribute uh, seeds for us, you know, and I think what's really cool for us to think about, too, is they really do help keep insect populations down. Like if you're complaining about mosquitoes outside, maybe don't have stagnant water, maybe look at having running water and getting birds and because they'll eat the mosquitoes for you and bats, too. Can we talk about bats as well? We like bats. Yeah, bats are great pollinators. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, this is a whole rabbit hole. This is this is crazy. But once you start doing it, it to me is a really good way to get kids involved in the garden. I think that is a huge thing to get them. They start to plant things, understand the native plants, understand actually regionality. And, and I think that also leads to the rabbit hole of human history when you look at native plants and uh, who was eating them way back when, the ancestral people, you know, the indigenous people of our lands. And then it kind of gets you into that whole ecosystem, regionality, and then you're not spending as much water on like water bills, like a little bit less, right? Right. But then the kids Definitely. get to see birds come in. So have you witnessed any of that with kids being able to get in and do some of these projects as well? Um, so I personally don't have any children, but I have lots of friends who do. And, um, there's one person I'm thinking of in particular where she's very, um, very much into getting her kids out into nature and exploring. And she has incorporated some more of the native plants into her gardens. And she has noticed that the birds are coming in more and, and the butterflies definitely 
they're cool. definitely more focused on, I think, the butterflies, you know, like the monarchs, the black swallowtails. But the kids, um, they just, it's so much different than just seeing it in a book or seeing it like on a tablet mm. um, when they're coming to the garden and they get to interact with them in a safe way, of course. Um, it, it's just a totally yeah. different experience and it creates those memories that they're going to stick with, you know, that they're mm -hmm. going to grow up with. Well, let's talk about well, caterpillars too are cool for kids, right? We all, oh yeah, it's like, <laughs> dude, that's so cool. Uh, and when they get to see the metamorphosis and then seeing baby birds and everything, that's the other part of it that's cool. Um, I do want to talk about bird feeders at some point because you bring up in the book some really good points about how you know if you're going to have feeders, you got to keep them keep them clean and uh, diseases and things like that. So I want to talk about that, but let's just talk about the importance of gardening for birds. Um, I know National Wildlife Federation has that wonderful program too about doing this. And so if you're looking at becoming a certified backyard habitat, um, definitely get this book. It's going to really, really help you. Um, but I didn't understand like how serious this decline of our bird population is. Where are we? Because am I, did I read right? Like we're in the mill, we've like lost was it 3 billion birds? I don't have my notes right in front of me. Yeah. yeah billions, um, like millions and billions. Of yeah. Birds. It's terrifying. And when you think about how back in 1970, we had a lot more species of birds um, that aren't here today. Um, the state of the birds report, which came out in 2022, they reported that we've lost 29% of our birds. And that's where that 3 billion bird number comes from. Wow. Um, and there are about 70 bird species that have lost two thirds of their populations just in the last 50 years. And apparently if things don't change and, you know, we just keep on with the status quo, we're on track to lose another 50% in the next 50 years, just in North America. And that was also one of the findings in the state of the birds report in 2022. Um, and you know, the National Audubon Society, they're another big proponent of obviously helping the birds. And um, they estimate that 389 North American bird species are seriously threatened by climate change. And that's the birds that, you know, we commonly see in the gardens like Baltimore Orioles, or if you're out West, you might see the Allen's Hummingbird. Um, and then, you know, all the several warblers that are coming in, mm -hmm. um, crossing over your property probably during spring and fall migration. So there's wow. a lot of habitat loss, um, a lot of food loss, because if we're just planting those um, foreign plants, you know, like the popular ones that are found in a lot of the stores that don't host those native insects, we've lost food for the birds. So they're they're up against a lot of challenges right now. Mm. Mm. The, so a lot of, and you know, we do a lot of uh, work with parks and public lands and have gone through some wildlife refuges where a lot of times the wildlife refuges are actually taking over old historic farms and ranches and stuff. And one in particular really fascinated us was uh, Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuges in South um, Arizona. It's it is and it's a uh, short grass prairie land. And people think of Arizona and you don't think prairies. And I've become like a, I'm huge advocate for prairies and we're losing our wetlands and our prairies to very important uh, ecosystems that are support biodiversity, you know? And so these prairies in Arizona, I was like, what? We have a prairie? Yes. And then they were reintroducing the Bob uh, quail, the Bobcat quail, Bob. Oh, um, Bob it's White's Bob. Maybe? Yes, Bob. Bob's. It's Bob. It's Bob. But they were losing Bob's. So they brought back the Bob's <laughs> quail, Bob White's. Yeah. So they're bringing them back. But to do that, they had to get the actual landscape in the prairie back. And through that, they were able to reintroduce pronghorn antelope, which is like really wow. amazing. The water started to come back. The wild, I mean, it's just amazing. They were doing a lot of um, controlled burning. And people were like, oh, no, you can't burn. In yeah. But you know what was amazing? Uh, one of the, um, it was actually the superintendent at the time took us out and showed us like, here's all these forbs and all these different like native flowers and plants that came back because of this. And you could see the difference between where they hadn't done that restoration work and what had been. And when you go, like I have photos of like one poppy, like Arizona native plant poppy with multiple spiders, butterflies, caterpillars, I mean, all on one little poppy. Oh. And I'm like, dude, I didn't even know these things existed. <laughs> right. And then there's a fly catcher that's like, get off my poppy, man. That's my breakfast. You know? <laughs> so, but now like, as we travel, I'm really aware of like, when we go in these parks and public lands, like they did 
the restoration work. I can now like see like this is a healthy system. So I think it's really good for our soil and, and these corridors of wildlife, but I always want to bring it back to people so that we understand why birds are important to people. And you did a really good job of that in the book and also showcasing how birds have been so important historically. Oh, you know? thank you. Not just the canary <laughs> in the mine, but hey, they did do that. Yeah, that was an important yeah. one for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For unfortunate reasons, but yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's sad. But yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about that importance of I mean, I get excited about these Forbes and now I'm like, I went down the rabbit hole, but what happens for us humans? Oh, well, there's so many um, studies that they've put out about just how you can hear bird song and that can influence like your mental health. And that also ties into um, getting outside and just seeing nature. There's a lot of more reports coming out now, scientific studies of showing how like just seeing trees in your neighborhood can help as well with your well-being. Uh, so the birds definitely play play into that. Um, they do, like you mentioned, have a significant um, place in our history. And in the book, um, I did pull out like a couple of pop culture references. Like we have, you know, sports teams named after birds. Um, they show up in books, you know, like uh Harry Potter had the, I think it's Hedwig, who is the most popular snowy owl. <laughs> um, say, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then um, there was a lot of cultural significance for um, Native Americans for birds. So, you know, we like touch upon that really quickly in the book. Um, but I think a lot of people are able to recognize like one or two birds right like they'll recognize that cardinal they'll come in or maybe the robin um but then once you start noticing one and you start seeing who else is coming in um i think it helps expand your um your mm -hmm. knowledge of the topic too i it almost feels like a gateway you know <laughs> like you get yeah. into like oh i've got one in my yard and now a new one has shown up and that's really cool and then you start either looking it up in books and finding out more about them or there's so many apps now that can help you identify um it's even so cool. what you're hearing in the yard and um one of them is the merlin bird app and it uses ai to you know turn on and listen to what you're hearing and it'll say oh that sounds like you have a baltimore oriole in your yard or you have cool. a wren and it's just it also helps people um recognize like oh now i know that brown bird is called a, a carolina wren and and it just definitely helps with that nature connection for sure that's when there's good AI, right? That's the right. positive AI. There, <laughs> there, AI has got some good tools. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying there's some weird stuff going on out there, that, though. That's true. <laughs> but I think this Leave is, it to again, the bird this people to make it right. <laughs> yeah, but this balance is really important. Um, and also, um, be careful with those apps playing back bird calls to birds. That's a, oh, that's a yes. no, no, that's a no, no, right? Like, you absolutely. Don't, there's birding etiquette. Um, yeah. Don't, and don't try to get too close to a heron. They'll get mad. They'll squawk at you. Oh, I've done that by accident. <laughs> yeah. Not meaning to, you know, it's like, oh, there's a heron. Let me get closer to get a better photo. And then they're like, wah, <laughs> get away. <laughs> you ruined my yeah. fishing expedition. That's you know? a perfect, um, a great point that you bring up too. Like when it comes to photographing the birds, like, um, you really shouldn't get too, too close to the nests because that can mm -hmm. um, either draw attention to their predators that like, oh, there is a nest in this shrub or it could oh. scare off the uh, parents. They may not come back and feed the young as often. So that's important too. If you're going to like, if you do actually have access to a nest, like you have to use those long lens to, mm. to take those photos just so you don't get too close. And like you said, not using the bird app for um, bad reasons. Like you don't want to start using, um, to call out like an owl or something because it's going to throw them off their range. And I mean, owls are a whole thing too. Uh, I think they get a celebrity status just because of, mm. of the type of, um, you know, being that they are. And uh, it's easy for them. people to get excited and want to see them, but that can disrupt them too. Like it's really important to keep their locations secret in a way, mm. just so they don't get, um, you know, paparazzi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no, no. This is really true. I mean, it's like even when you're out in a park or hiking um, to just keep that kind of balance, you know, and, and respect it, it is. Yeah. Um, going back to this importance, too, is they're pollinators. Birds are pollinators and that's and seed distributors. Right. So if you're gardening with native plants, this is like this could help reforest our, our <laughs> replant our, our country in a way, because I always talk about these dead zones. 
And I think this can really happen in our neighborhoods where suddenly it's just lawn, lawn, lawn. And if you don't have, like you can tell a good lawn from a bad lawn, a good right. lawn, they left the dandelions, you know, and let the clover be, you know what I mean? And, and have some of those natural things, but we, we get all those pesticides and I'm not saying don't have a lawn. You can have a little patch, have a micro patch. <laughs> there you go. I know you like micro, micro gardening. <laughs> I mean, there's some parts, you know, you want your kids to play and stuff like that, but right. I think it's important that we don't create these dead zones because it's actually not good for our health. We start like you having the right trees. I mean, we've done shows on this with American forests about uh, what is your tree equity and the importance of planting the right tree in the right place. And then finding out um, socially, we it's there's been some injustice in what gets planted where. And I think native plants, um, you could sometimes go, even go to your your uh, your electricity board or your water board. A lot of times we'll have like plant sales and help you do this if you're doing a native. I don't know if you've seen that up where you are in Connecticut. Yeah, um, I haven't seen it in my area, but I've heard about um, um, there's, you know, uh, communities that they're encouraging you to remove those Bradford pear trees and replace oh, yeah. it with like a native tree. And um, I've heard of things like that. And I know the conservation groups up here really do a good push of when they're doing their plant sales in the spring of offering those native native tree mm. options. So you're not just forced to do, you know, what's available at the big box store. Mm. Now, when you first got into native plants, um, did you connect with people who thought native plants were going to be ugly versus the, you know, the decorative, you know, invasives? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I am fortunate in that I'm surrounded by a lot of fantastic independent garden centers. Uh, we have an organic one nearby called NatureWorks. There's another one um, that focuses on growing a lot of their own plants in um you know, two towns over called Country Flower Works, um, Country Flower Farms, I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, they do a lot of um, not growing plants with pesticides and promoting organic practices. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot just from, you know, over time, like visiting their workshops. And um, that's where I think those aha moments helped c come in for me too, when I started growing um, more of the pollinator friendly plants to help my vegetables. And then um, as we talked about earlier, that rabbit hole of everyone else coming in. Um, so I think that community has really helped, but there's mm -hmm. definitely uh, an undercurrent of if you have a native garden, it's going to look wild and unkempt, like, you know, stereotype out, out there. Um, but that's not the case. Like any, mm -hmm. any garden that you don't really care for and just let it go wild, whether it's native or not, can, you know, be an eyesore. Um, it really depends on what you're planting there, but there's so many great native plants that you can combine. And, and like we said earlier, there's different eco regions. So some plants will do better in, you know, out West as opposed to, um, in mm. the Southeast. So there's a lot of, um, knowledge that you can just gain by going to those garden centers and asking for their suggestions of what does well. And if, mm there's a plant that you really like. Um, let's say there's a tree, uh, but it's not meant for my growing zone. If you can find out those dimensions, like, oh, I know it's going to grow this tall and it's going to produce fruit for this this type of bird in this season, there's a chance that you can find something comparable to that species that would be good for your area. So um, okay. that's that's where that whole rabbit hole starts again, right? Like, But oh, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. And what's great is like, you I know people were always, especially when we lived out in the desert Southwest, I, I, we had an amazing garden and it was, uh, we, first thing we did, we, we started going with wildflower seeds and then we realized our soil totally sucked. Like it was, <laughs> it, cause it was still had that new house kind of thing from the people oh, yeah. before us and they didn't garden or anything. In fact, when we were there, the, the previous owners started showing me, oh, you have to get rid of these weeds. And I'm like, that's a desert primrose. What are you doing? Dude? Oh, no, <laughs> I'm not buying the house if you keep doing that, you know. Yeah. So it was like this crazy thing. But um, all our little wildflowers came out like little teeny things. And we had to redo the soil because wow. there were so many chemicals. So, you know, this is why I said the, this rabbit hole of what, you know, hey, looking at let's get more birds. And that means you're going to have an elk, uh, like a healthy environment even just breathing wise because if you're fixing your soil you're fixing your air yeah you know I, I believe too but they bring in the birds bring in extra color you know so it's not just the plants and having flowers all the time 
or berries, which right. are really good for, for birds. But it's that part too, I think, right? Is is that you're getting more color. And I, w- I would love to see a painted bunting. Like, don't you, have you yes, seen them? I haven't oh. in person, but I would love to. <laughs> we were just in South Texas looking for them. and um, But we did see whooping cranes from the original whooping crane wow. family of this country. Yes. Oh, that's They're amazing. endangered birds. That, but we saw them, they're like, they're just so mystical in a way they're like and yet they're like swans they love each other like they're just this couple that were just everything was so connected and it was like we just sat watching going wow this is why we need our wetlands too right and you talk about that rain gardens and so we need to look at a house and like where your home is even if it's a patio or whatever what your environment is of what you can do according to not just plants but do you have like the ability to have a wetland in in your backyard like a meadow right yeah and um you know maybe your property borders a stream and you can work Mm -hmm. on bringing in some plants that are going to do well in that really wet area and will be tolerant of when like the water goes up and down uh just due to rainfall so yeah there's a lot of different options um and that's part of the fun too is seeing what your area is kind of like its own microclimate and what it can host. Um, and you had said about how they're bringing in the the color and bringing mm-hmm. in um, just so much like, I, I don't worry about if I have a pest that shows up in my garden because I know it'll be taken care of. Um, mm-hmm. so it might look bad, you know, like, uh, like I have a viburnum that might get um, some bugs on it, but in a couple, you know, weeks, the birds usually find it, take, take them off and you know, everything's yeah. fine. So it's, it's nice. And, um, uh, it's nice knowing that I don't have to worry about it and it's going to work out. <laughs> well, I remember also we had some roses in, in the house when we first moved there and um, they got aphids, but because we had planted all these other natives, like all these birds started coming Yep. and we had little goldfinches and they just chowed down and we're like, we don't have to do anything. They're, yeah. We're just like, look at this. It's we're great. eating them and we're not, <laughs> we're not paying to feed them, you know? Right. And, and we then... had roadrunners that got snakes. Roadrunners are great. Yeah, roadrunners will eat rattlesnakes and stuff, you know? Oh, that's awesome. That's another one I want to see in person. (laughs) Oh, we just saw one the other day. They're so cool. Roadrunners are amazing in in the desert southwest. They will come in and they eat meat. You know, some people actually feed them mincemeat, which you you don't want to... Well, you don't need to feed them probably, but depends on their habitat these days, you know? So Yeah. yeah, let's talk about that. Planting versus doing like hey I'm gonna feed them like we have to watch out even I'm wondering about this because what how good is the food out there now if if our food for our animals isn't good and for people how good is it for birds um well I guess it really depends on what's available in your area Mm -hmm. um I've definitely noticed just having all the plants in my yard um it brings in a lot of birds um, to the point where now we're even getting the hawks coming through because they're noticing that there's so much activity out front. Um, But yeah, it really depends. Like if you have plants that are native to your area, they're going to be producing, um, well, not producing, but they're going to be growing and attracting the insects that grow on that, that will feed off of them, um, which then attract the birds. But then if you're growing, um, you know, a lot of foreign plants or letting those invasive plants mm-hmm. kind of take over, like, uh, I know there's a lot of trees in Connecticut that are affected by bittersweet. Um, and that's like the, or the foreign version that kind of takes over the tree and it just, you know, mm. like the birds will eat those berries, but they're not nutritionally, good you know because then they'll disperse them and then that plant will spread right so that's not good either um so by offering the plants that are better um if you can get the straight species that's great because they're the ones that are like the closest to like the original Mm. version right um i think there's still like a a debate about cultivars like native cultivars um and what they offer I think it's still better to grow a native cultivar than something exotic, you know, because mm-hmm. at least you're still offering something on the menu for them. But yeah, if you can get like a straight species of uh, like a straight comb flower, I think that might attract more in the long run mm-hmm. and be a better producer of food. 
Yeah, because you're looking at nectar for like hummingbirds and then seeds later, sometimes berries, yeah. right? Like mockingbirds loved berries. We had pyracantha at one point. Now, is that a bad, bad plant? Is that a good plant or a bad plant? Um, I actually, I can't recall if that one's... I know that they're saying like Mandini, the heavenly bamboo thing is not necessarily good depending on where you live. Yeah. And the country can be, you know, it's like pompous grass can be great and not great, you know, right. depending, you know, but the pyracantha, man, the mockingbirds just chowed down on those berries. And it, it actually, because we used to have roadrunners too. They hung out with our feral cats when the coyotes came up. They would all oh go gosh. up on the roof together. Believe it or not, it's crazy. <laughs> but you know, but when you had and we never got snakes. Never. Wow. We had well, we had the neighborhood live in our backyard because we did provide water. And I think moving yep. water is a good thing too, right? Versus stagnant. We want absolutely. Moving. Yeah. Mm. Um, and water is such an important part of um, the offerings for your garden. So you do want to have those plants that are going to offer the food, right? So either the insects, the seeds or the berries, you want to have um, plants, shrubbery, trees, they're going to offer, offer, mm. offer cover um, to protect them from, you know, predators and then um, nesting places too. And then that fourth piece there is that available water and that's mm. especially important in the winter time especially when you have areas that have frozen water sources and it's harder to get that yeah. fresh water so if you can keep out um heated bird baths and keep them clean um so they offer that fresh water that definitely will also help bring in the birds to your property um and that's how i originally oh. attracted eastern bluebirds to my garden was that they were just flying over in the winter and they happened to see that i had water um and then they started coming and visiting and now i now i have them more regularly they've gotten used to oh, oh my gosh and they're so beautiful they're oh, so, they're so beautiful <laughs> do you have little bluebird boxes on your property? i have up the boxes um i'm still trying to get the placement correct because i do okay. have house sparrows also and then that's like a whole thing where the house sparrows fight with the bluebirds um so i'm trying to <laughs> trying to encourage just the bluebirds and so not the house everybody sparrows. yeah like everybody split up be kind be yeah. nice you know <laughs> that's funny you know it's angry birds here it is you know <laughs> but, but now with the plant with the seed you can get to that point where you really don't need to do the seed, right? And and yes. I want to talk about that because you mentioned, like you did a whole section in the book, you know, bird-friendly gardening, everyone, go get it, go pre-order. It comes out in April, just saying, <laughs> go to frowzinny.com. <laughs> um, it's through Cool Springs Press. They, they do an awesome job. Um, but you talk about making sure things are clean. Like I noticed that even with hummingbird feeders, you know, that is something that, Oh, just leave it for a day. No, uh -uh. I've seen ants get in there and that actually causes like a little mold or depending on where you are too, heat wise. Yes, definitely. I think um, when it comes to the bird feeders, like you can have really good intentions and put it out there and say, oh, I'm feeding the birds. But like you said, if you don't keep it clean, um, it can sometimes create more problems than it's worth. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I think, especially true with the hummingbirds because that sugar solution that you use to feed them, um, it can spoil really quickly in the very hot temperatures or if it's in direct oh. sun. So if you are in a, you know, in an area where it's like 80, 90 degrees all day long, you probably really want to consider refreshing that daily and cleaning, cleaning the feeder, um, just so bacteria doesn't build up that the solution doesn't get cloudy because all those things can then affect the hummingbirds negatively where they can get like swollen tongues and then they won't be able to feed oh. anymore. So then, you know, you've gone and done the opposite of what you, you're right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. That's sad. Yeah. Just keep them clean. I think, you know, um, I've been places where you go and you see like a huge rainstorm has come through and, you know, as we travel doing our parks and public lands, we also pet sit. So we're doing, we're, we know gardening across America now. It's pretty darn cool. That's awesome. And, I mean, one lady we pet sat for, she was like, okay, well now every night here comes the raccoon and there's Stumpy and it's got three legs. And then there's Alvin's. She's like, I have one Alvin, the chipmunk, one raccoon. And I'm like, oh no, you don't. You have a whole family on both sides. She's like, really? You know, so a lot of people have wild uh, wildlife cams. Like here where we are in Lubbock, Texas, our friend here, she has birds. They just feed them, but she feeds all the uh, wild cats out here. And she oh. makes sure that they're all spayed and neutered. She's very cool but now she has this is lubbock in in suburbia like complete suburbia there's fox 
two fox that come. There's possums and possums are good. They're yeah, good for possums your are they, great. They eat ticks, man. We want animals that eat ticks, you know? Absolutely. So <laughs> she's got this whole thing going and you can look out and you'll see like the mama cat lying there and a raccoon and the cats they, and the fox. Everyone's, I don't know how it's happening, but in the during the day, <laughs> there's like bluebirds and uh, blue jays and blue jays and doves. And it's kind of crazy. I'm always like, what is going on here? But she, there's water, there's a garden, you know, and then she feeds, you know, animals, fruit and things. But that's the thing. Like Iowa, this lady had a running pond and she had a meadow, like just natural meadows with just wildflowers oh, and we didn't get any work done. I'm like, do we really have to do a podcast? <laughs> I saw more birds, towies and all of that just, you know, but we, we did feed like a little bit of bird seed. They would come, but I didn't really see a change. Like if we didn't fill, fill it on time, they did look at you like, come right. on, you know, <laughs> it's like going for fast food, but like if a rainstorm came through or something like we've done that, like in um, Georgia and, and Arkansas and places that, it can get really humid. And that seed, I've seen that seed, like literally grow plants overnight. Like yeah. you've got to be careful, right? It's like right. wet yeah, paper it, horses. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if it spoils. Um, yeah, that's definitely not good for them. Um, you know, it comes down to like the same premise, like I wouldn't eat spoiled food, right? So why would you be leaving it out for, mm. for the animals to eat? Um, and then you know, so keeping, keeping that um, food fresh, getting rid of the stuff that's you know, ruined by rain mm -hmm. or whatever, just it's been out there too long. Humidity. Yeah. Yeah. In the summer can happen. Yeah. Humidity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I tend not to feed really too much in the summer. Um, I do have like one of those, you know, fun bird cameras where it photographs who comes to the feeder. So I'll cool. keep that up for the summer. But um a lot of my stuff comes down then just because of those weather conditions, right? Because it's just not um mm. hospitable. But I know that there's other things in the yard that they can get food from. So they're covered. Yeah. And like you said, even if you don't fill the feeder, they find other things to eat. Um, when, so that's yeah, good. it's the water. I remember she had a problem with her water pump and she's like, I don't care about anything. This pump has to be fixed. This was the, <laughs> and, but as soon as that water came back, it was like, here comes everybody. Like, oh it's yeah. Here, you know, and you'd see all the, I mean that the water to me was more important than the seed. And that's yeah. what we saw. And the garden, yeah. I mean, it was just so interesting because sometimes you didn't even know birds were there like if you go through a prairie land and we were just on a coast and there was like prairie scrub actually it's wild but it's there and I didn't see this I was actually going to photograph some pelicans and I was all okay. excited the pelicans are here and I just take this little pathway down to the coastline and all of a sudden all these birds just flew out of nowhere like literally <laughs> came out of the ground but they weren't they were you couldn't even see them. And that's the other thing. Have you noticed that with, you know, all the wildflowers and, and things like that, when you start growing tall grasses, grasses are really important. Um, oh yeah, definitely. You see like that there's different level, birds are in different levels of the garden. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And that comes down to even like how they nest, right? Like there's a bunch of birds that will nest on the ground and will need that cover from um, those like the prairies you were talking earlier, um, that type of cover. Mm. Um, there's birds that will nest in shrubbery and then, you know, the typical trees, right? So they are in those those different layers and depending on, you know, so many factors like where what they belong to, what type of you know, beak they have, <laughs> like that all plays into like where they nest, but yeah, wow. they're, um, they're everywhere. And that's why I think it's so important too. When you go out to these nature trails, right. Um, that you do stay on the path, right. And you're not just mm. cutting across like a grassy field because you might be unknowingly stepping into like a nesting area, um, that mm. wasn't, you know, blocked off. I know some of the beaches up, um, on the Northeast coast, they do a good job of blocking off the areas for, um, the nesting piping season. clovers, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah, for they're... the same reason. So you don't trample all over everything. And sound. Sound is also the other thing I'm starting to realize. I think we have sound pollution and yeah. light pollution. Light pollution. Now, do you look at that in regards to um, lighting in the garden? Because I know you do about projects. You talk about windows, um, all of that, so that birds aren't smacking into your window every day. Because you know, that's also really sad because that reflective can can be a mess. 
Um, but you had a, a wonderful artist in the book. And I love, by the way, that you have all these different people and what they're doing in their region across the country in the book. That is really cool. So you can kind of identify with where you are. But tell us a little bit about that, because you can set up all of this wonderful stuff, you know, and have the garden going. But if they're smashing into the windows and from what I'm reading and hearing, it sounds like we need to turn our lights off at night, like our outside lights. Absolutely. So maybe not having you know, I thought the twinkly lights were cool, but now I'm finding out maybe not. Yeah. I think the problem really, um, comes in with like the exterior lighting that's pointing upwards, especially, um, anything that can disorient the birds when they're trying to migrate overnight. Mm -hmm. A lot of birds will travel, um, at nighttime to get to their destinations, especially in the fall and the spring migration. Um, and then in, you know, people think, oh, well, I'm not in a city. I don't really have to worry about outdoor lighting, um, but it still can affect how they navigate because it'll distract them. Sometimes, like especially in the cities, they'll they'll kind of mm -hmm. get caught up in that um, bright light and they won't be able to oh. kind of break free of it. And then that can disorient them and they can, you know, crash into a glass building, right? Because it, it looks okay to them. Um, they can't see that it's a, a glass, right? Um, so there are window um, products that you can get um, to make your your house windows even safer because, uh, you know, like those big, beautiful bay windows, they can be a little bit troublesome because if they're reflecting the nature mm -hmm. outside, it looks like to a bird, oh, there's more trees when it's actually reflecting back like the tree. In and the they're yard. flying like full steam ahead. Right, right. So when they hit that full speed, um, they can give themselves concussions. They can really, um, really hurt themselves. And there's mm. some great wildlife rehabbers, especially in the New York area. Um, I think it's like Wild Bird Inc. And they collect all these birds that um, run into, fly into buildings and they rehab, mm. rehab them and get them back out again. Um, so if you can prevent that from happening in the first place, that's, that's yes. ideal. And that could be from like painting your windows just with some pretty, you know, tempera yeah. paint or um, doing those decals that reflect the UV light because the mm -hmm. birds can see the UV light um, in different mm -hmm. spectrums than we can. So that helps them know that like, oh, there's, there's something there that's not something to fly. Yeah. Through. Don't be careful. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also, I think this is great about talking about the night, uh, nighttime as well, um, because we forget that birds do fly at night. For some reason, we all think, oh, no, but they, yeah, they go migrate to bed. <laughs> over at night. They don't. Well, they, they, you know, they do go to bed, but also, you know, that they do, they're active at night, you know, and then there's yep. even plants. There's wild plants that come out. There, there's um, pollinator gardens, just moon gardens that you yeah. can do, like the Daytura, right? The Daytura plant yep. um, is beautiful. And like, you know, there's certain moths that will go in at night. And I don't know about birds in the evening, but um, if they're migrating, they're migrating, maybe not eating, but you can do all these different cool things, you know, yeah. to reflect light that you yeah. don't have to hurt. You don't have to hurt the birds that way. They'll understand those plants versus yeah. a light. Yeah, Right. And those cool. lights too, um, a lot of it's like unnecessary stuff, right? Like uh, you have security lights on for like your whole driveway, right? you can change that if you still want to have that light protection in case there is, you know, someone on your property that shouldn't be, you can make that motion activated. So that way, if there is a threat, um, the light yeah. comes on for that moment, but it's not on all night long. So even mm. changes like that will make a big difference and help the birds. And then and still it also helps your help electricity you. bill. Oh yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> you know, so there's that, that's what I'm saying. This rabbit hole is so cool because you do one thing, but it's, cleaning up the environment it's you know it's just doing there's so many things while you're just going I want more birds in my garden well you're getting a whole other range of benefits with this Absolutely. which is super cool that is super cool okay so favorite native plant and what does it attract for you the birds um I have to say my favorite is actually the aster um and wow. I like it because it gives you that late season color, right? So it's helpful for the migrating butterflies coming, monarchs coming through in my area. Mm -hmm. um, and it also attracts a host of insects, which then attract the birds. Um, so I'm feeding the birds with the caterpillars that use it as a host plant, and then also um, the seeds that it produces. And then I like to leave them up in the fall uh, so they're standing, and that produces um, cover for the birds mm -hmm. in the winter as well. So that way, a lot of the ground feeding Ooh. birds, like the juncos or the sparrows, um, they'll be on the ground kind of feeding, seeing what's around, um, but they're protected too. Um, so mm -hmm. that's that's my favorite. I 
I do feel like it changes over time, you know, <laughs> but yeah. right now I am, I am hot on the, on the asters, <laughs> the native asters. Hey. <laughs> I, you know, I just, it gets so, I get excited when I see like wildflowers. We talked about this before we started recording on the highways and byways and like, just, it, it's like, okay, you know, you're, we, we need to kind of un, um, unsterile ourselves. Do you, do you know what I mean? There's just these very st- sterile environments. Yeah. And, these housing communities and I understand why they're there and everything but a lot of times they're taking out native plants when they're coming in and then you know that the soil got toxified right and then a lot of times you're not allowed to have these free-flowing meadow gardens and things like that you know and so I'm hoping we start getting more environmentally friendly housing projects you know, and I think we're getting there. I mean, there's some, I know Global Green USA did um, some projects where they were getting composting into apartment complexes and things That's like great. that. Wow. So there's certain programs out there, but sometimes it, it needs to start with us, you know? Right, right. And <laughs> it's know? easy to get discouraged when you read those news, the news that like the birds are declining and like, well, what can I do? That's such a big, big problem. But um, even if you live in an HOA community, you can start by having those conversations about, all right, I understand you want certain perimeter, like, you know, certain shapes, a certain look, what can we find that would be um, acceptable, but it's a native option. And and there's a few options we give in the book, or I give in the book that says, um, uh, you know, if you have an HOA community, these are some things you can use to start the pro- topic or you could grow in containers. Um, so just having those conversations makes a big difference. Planting one or two things in your yard, like you don't have to rip out your whole yard if it's full of, you know, na- uh, foreign plants, but maybe you're going to start adding in more native plants to complement mm-hmm. those. And over time that creates more variety too. And you'll start bringing in, um, you know, more birds, more pollinators that way. Yeah, I like that. And I think you can also be, you know, an inspiration for the rest of the neighborhood, whether or not it's a HOA, you know, yes. start, start doing, it. I mean, when we had that house in the desert, you know, people would walk by and they're like, no way, like you can have, you know, we're like, yeah, you know, celebrate your cactus. They're, the blooms are amazing. They're amazing. And some of the prickly pear cactus, if you go and put your finger in the middle, they close up on your finger like an anemone. See an anemone? Oh, that's cool. Because that's how they bring the the pollinators in. Oh, like, I got you. Nice. Come on in. And then they open up again. So that's wow. cool. But then I thought, that's really cool to show kids and stuff. And then I go, oh, maybe I took all the pollen. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But a park ranger showed us that, which was cool. But but this is a, such a delightful conversation. But everyone, the book is beautiful. It's one I love gardening books, and you've got great illustrations. Um, you make things so easy to understand. Oh, thank you. So I you. think this is going to be a huge hit for people, and it's out for spring, out for Earth Day. This is something people can do. We always look at what can we do. Plant a native plant and start and put some water out there for the birds, you know, start doing some of those projects. So and also share on social media. You talk about that in your book, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, join. Definitely would love to see what people do. Yeah. And get rid of those HOAs. I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Don't let them rule your world too much. I know. I know. (laughs) Kidding, but not kidding. Uh, Everyone, again, the book is by Jennifer McGinnis, and it is Bird Friendly Gardening Guidance and Projects for Supporting Birds in Your Landscape. You can go to her website, frauzinni.com, and she's on Instagram, Facebook, everywhere. Uh, Keep up with Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us here. Oh, thank you so much. I love chatting about birds and pollinators and all things gardening. It's my favorite topic. Oh, we topic. do too. I know Nancy <laughs> and, and Margo. Margo is normally on the show with us. Uh, she's an amazing uh, nature photographer. Um, I know she's going to be like, oh, I wish I was there. But everyone keep up with her. Uh, Margo Carrera can go to uh, margocarrera.etsy.com and check out her photography. She does these beautiful shawls and scarves yeah. with her wildflowers and everything on there. I saw so, they're know, gorgeous. She's amazing. So um, anyway, there's the thing. Thanks so much, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio's Nature Connection Show. Follow us at bigblendradio.com and keep up with Margo at margocarrera.etsy.com. <laughs>